I'd like to preach to you tonight a ram, a he-goat, and the end of the world. A ram, a he-goat, and the end of the world. Let's go to our Abba Father and pray. Father, I thank you for the familiarity that has come through what Christ has done for us that we can call you Abba. And Lord, we love you and we, we want to be as close to you as we possibly can. And Father, we, we need you tonight. I pray that you would highlight and you would inflame your word. And I, I know that you wrote these things for our learning. I know that you wrote those, these things to change us and to correct us and to work on our lives and to give us hope. And uh, I just pray, Lord, that every person in here, that you would give them aid to, to learn and to grow and to get a bigger view of what's going to happen at the end of the world. And I pray, Father, that uh, you would help me. And I pray that, that uh, you will allow the, the scriptures, each verse, to speak for themselves and that we can have instruction. Spirit of God, we need you. Illuminate us. Help us. Give us wisdom that we don't have to understand these things. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. The end of the world, the end of all things, is nearer and much nearer than when the word of God that we are about to preach about was written at first. You need to understand, and I need to understand, that we are marching towards the end of all things. All hell is about to break loose, literally, and we need to understand as much as we can about it. I know that since Jesus Christ went away, that every generation of believers have believed these things, have believed that the end of all things is very, very near. It's just the fact that one of these days, a generation just like ours is, is going to experience these things right into their fulfillment. And I believe there's a very good chance that we are that generation. These heavy prophecies are the word of God, as mind-blowing as they can be, as confusing as much as you want to haze over tonight. They are profitable for our reproof, our correction, our instruction in righteousness. And I ask you to grab hold as much as you can in these next minutes to understand Daniel chapter 8. Turn there, please, in your Bibles, Daniel chapter 8. Beginning at Daniel chapter 8, the chapter we'll look at tonight, a very strange thing happens. And I want you to understand this. This is a little Bible trivia to, for you to tuck in your belt. Up to this point, Daniel has been written in the language Aramaic, okay? Not Hebrew, in Aramaic, okay? That makes sense. He's in Babylon, uh, Babylon and all thing, and, and, and all of that. The first three verses of chapter 1 are in Hebrew, and then boom, it switches to Aramaic. Clear up to chapter 7, through chapter 7. And then all of a sudden, God gives no need to, he needs to not explain anything to anybody, or Daniel doesn't either, but he changes the language that he's writing in. And he writes in his heart language. He writes in Hebrew from this point on. It's pretty clear the reason why as we come to Daniel 8. We see here things that specifically are going to happen to Israel. And I think that's the reason for the language change. And it's pretty clear, and other scholars believe the same thing. And so we're going to read Daniel chapter 8. I am going to be very sweet and nice to you and allow you to sit through this if you promise that you will try to focus as we read Daniel chapter 8. So here we go. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. And I saw in a vision... And it came to pass when I saw that I was at Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw, saw in a vision, and I was by the river Ula. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram, which had two horns. Okay, that's the first animal you need to imagine, one of two. Okay, a ram, which had two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, behold, a he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground. Okay, he's like flying. He's like hovering. And the goat had a notable horn, a big, a great horn between his eyes. So, so this is the second animal you need to imagine. It's a goat and it has a huge horn. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen before the river, 
and ran unto him in a fury of his power. And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with the color, that means like indignation or anger against him, and smote the ram and brake his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground, stamped upon him. There was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Therefore the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken. And for it came up four notable ones towards the four winds of heaven. And out of, so there's four horns. I mean, the one horn breaks, and there's four that come out of this goat's head. And out of one of them came forth a little horn. Okay, that's, that's recognizable from the last chapter. A little horn, which waxed exceeding great towards the south, towards the east, towards the, the pleasant land that may be Israel. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the host of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. And he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. Okay, if you question who that might be, we'll see later another, or that that one recognized in another place in verse number 25 and called the prince of princes. We know who this is. This is Jesus Christ. He magnified to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And a host, or a group of people, a great great amount of people, was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. So there's this big sin, transgression, that happened. Okay? And it was cast down, and it cast down the truth to the ground. The little horn did. And it practiced and prospered. And then I heard one saint speaking. Another saint say, said unto that certain saint which spake, How long will be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And it came to pass when I, even... When I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning, then there stood before me as the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, as Gabriel did. And when he came, I was afraid, and I fell on my face. And he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision, or at the end of time. Now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on the ground, or on my face toward the ground, and he touched me and set me upright. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia. Okay, we saw that empire Media Persia. It was a bear that was raised on one side. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia. Greece, or the Macedonia, the empire of Macedonia, Greece. And the king, or in the great horn that is between his eyes, is the first king. Now that being broken, where as four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance, okay, the little horn, and understanding dark sentences shall stand up, and his power shall be mighty, but not as his own power. He doesn't get his power for himself. And he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his, his policy also he shall cause craft, craft? to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall he uh, shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes. Now look at this last phrase. But he shall be broken without hand. And the vision of the evening and the morning, which was told, is true. Wherefore, shut up the, the vision, for it shall be for many days. And I, Daniel, fainted. <laughs> You gotta love Daniel. He's like so real. And was sick certain days. Afterward, I rose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. Wow. That's a lot of words. That's a lot of stuff. 
All right, stick with me tonight here. In chapter 6, we saw Babylon, where, where Daniel was in captivity seven years, or 70 years. You have to understand that this chapter 8, what is actually happening here, happens before chapter 6. We know that because he's, he's talking in verse number 1 about uh, Belshazzar, and at the end of verse number 6, Belshazzar was overthrown. So, In Daniel chapter 6, we see Babylon fall to the Medes and the Persians. Chapter 7 and 8 were written before that fall. There are two years that separate chapter 7 that I preached to you two weeks ago from this chapter 8 vision. We know this solidly by the timing of verse number 1. See, uh, we can divide this chapter tonight into three parts. Number 1, the animal vision. Okay, you got these two animals, the animal vision. Number 2, the two saints speaking. There's two saints in the middle that start speaking. And number three, Gabriel explains the vision. Okay, this angel, Gabriel explains the vision. So track with me that way. One, two, three, all right? This whole vision is both historic in the sense that Daniel was living some of these things. You know, Medes and Persians took over Babylon. You know, we kind of saw that there. And he's living these things. So it's historic in that way. But it's prophetic in the sense uh, of the, the fact that we are told that these things have to do with the end of the world. They are things that would happen to the end of the world, and specifically here, talking about Israel and the end of the world. First of all, point one, the vision, all right? The vision, okay? This, this, uh, this animal vision thing, okay? Though Daniel is in Babylon, he has a vision that he is in Shushan. Great. What's Shushan? All right. I have no idea. It, it kind of rhymes with Shushine, but it's not. It's Shushan, all right? This is what is important about this. Shushan is, uh, what is important, that Shushan is the capital of Persia that is about to conquer Babylon. Medo-Persia, Medo-Persia. So you you gotta understand that he is having a vision that he is there in the capital of his enemies. He is by this river, Ula. Remember, again, the vision is before the fall in chapter six. And as he's there in this vision, he sees this ram and it has uh, these horns. You see, uh, Verse number three, one horn is higher than the other, just like uh, the bear that was raised on one side in chapter seven. You remember the picture up here, the the bear was kind of raised on one side and had like uh, three ribs in its mouth. So here is this, here's this ram that has these two high horns. Here's Medio Persia. We know that from verse number 20, that it's about to invade Babylon where Daniel's in captivity. This is all history. This is all going to happen. You know, Daniel's having this vision, but it, it happens in chapter six. The ram was pushing, the Bible says here. He was ramming, he was budding west, north, and south. And this seems like the direction that the Medes and the Persians were conquering in these directions. And the Bible says in verse number four that nobody could stop the ram, okay? This ram was unstoppable, stoppable, and no one could deliver from the Medes and the Persians. They seemed so strong and they seemed so powerful. And that was certainly true of the Medo-Persian empire. But then a he-goat, verse five, comes out of the west, and I want you to know that, I'm a, that I'm, I was very scholarly and I was very faithful to study these things out. And you may not know what a he-goat is. And so I want to make sure that before you leave this place, you understand what a he-goat is. It's a goat. That's a he. <laughs> yes, you, you, you might laugh. Some of you farmers might laugh that I actually looked that up. But, you know, I thought maybe there's something else. It's a billy goat, okay? It's a, it's a he-goat. A he-goat comes out of the west. Uh, on the face of the whole earth, he's, he's covering great amounts of ta- territory. The Bible says here that he touched not the ground. You know, he was flying. He has a notable or a large horn, all right? We talked about him last week. It's Alexander the Great and the Macedonian Empire, or some say the Grecian Empire, okay? Though he was not Grecian himself, Macedonian. We're told exactly who he is in verse number 21, or we are told what this, you know, goat is in verse number 21, this he goat. You will remember that we saw him last week. Stick with me. Good animals. There's great points coming at the end. All right? You remember last week we saw him as the flying leopard with four heads. How many? Raise your hand if you remember the picture of the four-headed leopard. Okay, great. He had four wings. Okay, whatever. The four heads correspond with the four horns here in in chapter 8. And verse number 5 says that he touched not the ground. We already talked about the one thing that was true about Alexander as a conqueror and why he's called Alexander the Great is that he just absolutely devoured very, very quickly the kingdoms that he devoured. He flew. We see in verse number six through eight that the he-goat beats the tar out of the ram just as Medo-Persia did to Babylon. 
But this is where chapter 8 departs from the similarity of chapter 7. This is where things get different. At first, we see the goat has a notable horn between his eyes. Then, in verse number 8 and 9, we see that that big horn is breaking. It's turning into four horns. And out of those four, we see something that we recognize from last time, from the last chapter. It is a little horn. Look, please, in the Bible. Let's read it. Daniel 8, beginning in verse number 9 through 12. Let's read it again. The Bible says this. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the hosts and, uh, and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself, even to the prince of the hosts, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down, and a host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Do you remember the little horn from chapter 7? Here is really the turning point in this passage where history goes to prophecy. We have seen the little horn in chapter 7 and how terribly he was connected to the beast's body. And he is first historically represented by a guy that we talked about, Antiochus Epiphanes. He was the horrible one, the mad one, history calls him. He was later on from Alexander the Great. He was a Macedonian Grecian king who viciously invaded. You remember, this is the guy that offered the pig on the altar in Jerusalem. He invaded and occupied Jerusalem from 171 B.C. to 165 B.C. You remember, he was, he was, uh, he was re- uh, relentless and ruthless in his destruction. And as he came into Jerusalem, he killed everything, 40,000 in his path. He killed men and women and babies and pregnant women and whatever was there. He got to Jerusalem. He, he, he sacrificed that pig upon the temple altar, and he set up his idol there. He rose his, in history above the four horns of his empire, Greece, Uh, Western Asia, Egypt, and Persia to rule himself. But folks, as powerful as this guy is, and I remember when I was in college, when I was at BJ, I had Daniel Revelation class, and uh, you know, my my teacher, Jesse Boyd, Dr. Jesse Boyd, and uh, some some of you may remember Dr. Boyd, and uh, he would preach up there, he's a young man, and he would say all this stuff, Antiochus, Epiphanes, and blah, blah, and I was glazed over. I was just hoping to get married. You know, I was just hoping to make it through college and pay my bills so they didn't have to sit out or anything, whatever. And he, I looked like a lot of you look tonight, all right, like this. But as, as historic and as vicious and as much as this little horn does represent, does represent historically Antiochus Epiphanes, it has much greater representation in chapter 8 to someone else. And it's someone that we touched on in chapter 7. And that is the great Antichrist. Antichrist. In chapter 7, this little horn was attached to that horrible beast. Here we see him rising from this he-goat of the the Grecian Empire. And maybe this is a clue to his national descent and where he comes from, the little horn. He comes from no notable place. You know, I, I don't know. But this is none other than Antichrist. What is described here is his rise in that tribulation period and his dealings with Israel, the host, the loved host of the Lord. Verse number 10, the little horn Antichrist says, verse 10 says it waxed great even, even to the hosts of heaven. Okay, this guy transcends. He is greater than a man. You know, he is, he is taking on angels. He's greater than a man. He has superpowers. You know, we talk about the Avengers, all right? The Avengers look like nothing compared to the Antichrist. He cast down, the scripture says here in verse 10 and following, uh, some of the hosts of, of the stars to the ground and stamped on them. Some want to go back and say that this was a third part of the angels that went away with the devil. No, this is, his, this is prophetic, okay? This is, this is a great spiritual war that's going to happen in the skies. I don't know if people will observe it. I have no idea. Verse number 11, he, the little horn, magnifies himself even to the prince of the host. He, he's not content fighting the angels. He wants to take on Jesus. He's not full of himself, folks. He's full of Satan, literally. 
By him, the scripture says here, the daily sacrifice was taken away and the place of his, God's sanctuary, was cast down. This is probably talking about in some time in the future, and you all, some of you have seen things, some of you are watching things, everything from John Hagee, don't swallow everything John Hagee says, by the way, uh, you know, red moons to red heifers to all kinds of stuff, okay? And uh, it's good for you to, for good for us to look and to think. But the scripture talks about that there is coming a day when the temple sacrifice seems to be reestablished. We don't understand that. We don't know when, you know, when, uh, when Israel will get control of the temple, you know, you, most of you know there's a mosque there now where, it, where it's supposed to sit. We don't know when that happens, but we do know from 2 Tem- Thessalonians 2.9 that the Antichrist will be raised up d- during the end time, and he will not be empowered by himself. He will be satanically empowered by Satan himself, and you see those overtones in this chapter. He'll do great and miraculous things. He'll do outward miracles. He'll do outward craft, witchcraft. He'll do amazing things. And people will say, wow, he is the Christ. Look over at verse number 24, please. And his power shall be mighty, but not of his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. These verses indicate that his conquering isn't just here on earth. He's not just doing these great things here on earth. This is a spiritual battle as well. And I do not know how spiritual beings battle. I imagine that. I've I've seen paintings of that. And some people try to attempt to show how spiritual beings battle. I don't know if they have spiritual swords. I don't know if they clash spiritual armor. I have no idea. But this is... Beyond an earthly battle, a great spiritual battle. And I do know from the word of God, and you know too, that spiritual beings do battle. We see that all over the scripture. Not only are they battling us, principalities and powers battling us, but they're also battling each other. They fight each other in the Old Testament in different places. Great cherubim, seraphim, and hosts of God battle Satan and his fallen angels. And it seems that this is a terrible battle that wages at the end of all time. And Antichrist actually wounds some of God's angels, verse number 10. He actually throws some of them down to the ground. Again, we can't be totally sure what is going on here. We just know that it's horrifying. But the hosts of the stars do seem to be God's hosts of angels in this passage. Notice in verse number 11 that Antichrist magnifies himself even to Christ's position like Satan himself so many years before. He self-promotes to the status against the prince of the host. That's Jesus. Look at verse number 25. The scripture says, And through his policy also shall ca- he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. This is witchcraft. This is satanic craft from verse 24. And he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many. And he shall also stand up against the prince of princes. We know who that is. That is the Lord. That's Jesus Christ. Again, he shall stand up against the prince of princes. Such rebellion and such demonic arrogance against Jesus Christ. I want to take a time out from chapter 8 and I want to talk to you about something. Through looking at God's word, you know, I looked in Sunday school, we looked at a little passage where Jesus this morning in Mark 1, Mark 2 was casting out demons and they were like, you know, don't destroy us now. You know, I know, we know who you are, the Holy One of God, whatever, whatever. And that seemed to be the fact that they knew that they were headed for destruction through the arrogance that we see in the end of time, did it ever occur to you why Satan never gives up? I believe that Satan thinks that he's going to win. And I think as things roll on on this earth, and he has more and more outward control of things, I believe that Satan, till the end, believes that he is going to overthrow Jesus Christ, that he is going to raise himself above God. I will exalt myself, he says. I believe he he thinks he's going to get God's throne. Such rebellion, such demonic arrogance against Jesus. You think our world is disrespectful today because, you know, people say, can't say Merry Christmas 
in a couple of months, you think that that's a disrespect to Christ? Wait until Antichrist, full of Satan, shakes his fists at God and curses Jesus Christ and claims to be stronger than Jesus Christ, the real Christ. That will be rebellion. Wait until then. There are many today, folks, that think that they know better than God, that will not give their life to Jesus. In their hearts, they either neglect or, or rebelliously shake their fists at Jesus and say, I know better how I'm going to run my life. You know, I'm the, maybe it's a teenager in here that, that's standing before you. Is your whole life. You say, I don't, I'm not going to give my life to Jesus Christ. You know, I, I'm not even going to think about those things. That's the religion of my parents, whatever. In that final day, all that unspoken rebellion will be open war against Jesus Christ. Daniel chapter 8, verse number 12 says, A host was given him, a group of people, a host, against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground. So when this group of people comes under the influence or under the worship of Antichrist, the truth is, is thrown to the ground, and, and it practiced and prospered. The, the Antichrist, the little horn, he practiced and and he prospers in his own religion, his own satanic religion. The wording here is tough and confusing in verse number 12, but this beginning here is where we see really heavy Jewish kind of things. It seems to be saying that a host, a group of people, presumably many Jews, because it talks about the sacrifices, they want to practice religion by their sacrifices. Uh, They are given to him by some great delusion, some great lie, some great transgression. They go along with Antichrist. We know that there's this great peace treaty that is signed with Antichrist. They go along with him. And the Bible says that truth is cast down to the ground. How sad. We know at the beginning of the tribulation, period, as part of his rise to power, Antichrist will sign this grace peace treaty. Now, now, now time out. You watched the news, didn't you, this week? You, you on your app saw things about Israel and about Palestine and, again, and about, you know, ISIL or ISIS or whatever. You saw all that. Imagine if somebody could actually broker a deal with peace in the, for peace in the Middle East. You talk about the Nobel Peace Prize, well beyond the Nobel Peace Prize. He would become the leader of the world. Someone that could do that, that has not been done for thousands of years. And that's what Antichrist is going to do. He's going to broker this peace deal. And everybody's going to look to him. But is it a good deal for Israel? Is it a good peace deal? It's all a big, fat, hairy lie of false peace. And verse 25 says, And he by peace shall destroy many. He's a liar, he's a deceiver just like his father the devil is. Now this is where the chapter changes to our second point, two saints speaking, two saints speaking. If you're still awake, say amen. Amen. Okay, this would be a a great point if you've been like hazing out and thinking about roast beef sandwiches or whatever to get back on board. This is a great point. Point number two, great time to get back on board. Look at verse 13, 14. Then I heard one saint speaking. Okay, things change. This is scene number two. Then I heard one saint speaking and another saint saying, saint said unto that certain saint which spake boy that's a tongue twister how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot and he said unto me unto two thousand and three hundred days then shall the sanctuary be cleansed we do not know what is meant by these saints we don't know who they are perhaps they're messengers of god just in the vision whatever Two angels speaking together in the vision. Anyhow, the topic is how long? And it's how long this. How long will Israel be deceived? How long will they not be able to to practice their religion? How long will they not be able to continue with their sacrifices? And the answer comes back. The answer is 2,300 days. And then at the end of that, the sanctuary, the place of worship, will be cleansed. Folks, there is much, 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 much unknown here. The end of Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel, speaks about the rebuilding of the temple for Israel. And I know that you know some some about that. I know just enough to make me dangerous about that. But here, the 2,300 days adds up, you know, do your calculator, to about six and a half years. All right? That could be nearly the duration of the seven years tribulation. It could be talking about, you know, for half a year, then, then this deal is brokered, whatever, and then, it, then the Antichrist turns against Israel and, and, and puts down their sacrifices and their worship or whatever for the next six and a half years. That's, that's a possibility. 
Some think that these 2,300 days extend beyond the tribulation into the millennium period and talk about when Christ will take over of worship. Some say that these 2,300 days are the length of time that Antiochus Epiphanes, back to him, invaded Jerusalem till the time that he died. And it was inter- it's kind of interesting that after he invaded till the time that he died, he died in like 164 or 165 BC, is about 2,300 days. So I don't, you know, it's kind of strange, kind of weird. <laughs> Whatever, there's, there's something in the grammar here and then also in another verse that is in here that shows that these are literal days. It talks about evening and morning days. Just like this morning when I preach against evolution, you know, the sixth day, you know, God created man and woman, you know, the morning and the evening. It's a, there's the same kind of wording here. It looks like literal days. But the point is not like figure out the 2300. The point is when is the end? How long is it until Israel stays blinded? How long is it until Israel is taken advantage of? You say, that doesn't really matter to me, Pastor. It better matter to you because the Bible says that Israel is the apple of God's eye. You know, we were, we were the ones grafted in, not them. Blindness happened to them for a while so that we could be extended grace and salvation. You better believe that God still cares about Israel. Make much of Israel. Love Israel. Be the watchman on the wall for Israel. Sing. Pray for Israel. Pray for peace in Jerusalem. Love Israel. You will be on good terms. This is what our Lord loves. Why did he love Israel? Certainly not anything they did. It's, it's a love of grace, just like when Jesus saves you. It's a love of grace. You know, it's something he decided. He chose that people, not because of anything they did, because he chose them. Election. He chose them. And we should love them too. The point is the end. How long would worship of Israel be restrained? Folks, God's people Israel is blinded and will continue to be blinded during the time Antichrist greatly blinds them. He makes a false peace with them. But beyond, let me just say this, the big question between these two saints, how long? Here's the big question. Not, or here's the big answer, sorry. Not forever. Not forever. Israel will not be blind to Jesus, their Savior and King, forever. Hear the word of the Lord. Here it is. Romans chapter 11 and verse number 25 says this. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye, be, ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Folks, Israel will turn to Christ. The Davidic covenant will come true. Jesus will be their king. He will be their savior. It's coming. So the question of the two saints, how long? 2,300 days from that point, whatever, but not forever. Israel will Turn to the Lord. Their eyes will open. The question between these, these saints in the text is, how long will Israel be inhibited from worship? The answer is not forever. They will turn to their deliverer, Jesus, one day. And this is a great promise, and it's a great hope for Israel and everyone in this room that loves Israel. Click. Scene number three. Last point tonight. Gabriel explains the vision. Gabriel explains the vision. Look at 15 through 18, please. Daniel 15, excuse me, Daniel 8, 15 through 18. It says, And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning, then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. So, so what man is it, by the way, that, that bosses angels around? Because he's going to tell Gabriel in just a second what to do. Okay, is this a Christophany? I think it is. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. And so he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, understand, O O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. Now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face towards the ground. But he touched me and set me upright. So here in the vision, a man appears before him and cries, out over the river, he's echoing, you've yelled over a river before, he's telling the angel Gabriel to tell Daniel what it means, 
And again, I've already said that I believe this is Jesus commanding his angel. So Gabriel comes near to Daniel, and Daniel is so afraid, the scripture says, that he falls down on his face. And in verse number 18, it gets even better. It seems like he loses consciousness in the vision, and the angel has to wake him up. Daniel's a real guy. He's like, man, he's like confused. We saw him like in his own cogitations, a couple. He's like us. You know, he understood these things, by the way, less than we did. He was just like, what? I don't know what this, and it's got a ram, and a he go, and I don't know about all this. You know, and he's like, no, he faints. It's great, it's great stuff. Peter, or Daniel is as real as Peter was, okay? So Gabriel tells Daniel in verse number 17 that this vision is about the end of time, the end, the time of the end. This is the last days of prophecies, not just for Daniel's time, but he's talking about the end of the world. In verse number 19, Gabriel makes it even clear that he is speaking about the last end of the indignation. Indignation, tribulation, kind of idea, the end of the tribulation period. Folks, we will be raptured out of the world by that time. But this horrific stuff that we're reading about between satanic antichrist fighting, you know, the, the people that God loves, the saints and the Jews and Israel, this is what this, is what this vision is about. And Gabriel explains that the ram, Medo-Persia, and the goat, uh, Macedonia or Grecia, he explains the great horn, as I've already told you in verse 21, that we believe to be Alexander the Great. He explains the notable horn being replaced by four horns, and then a little horn coming up out of one of the horns. And then he explains the horror of Antichrist. Look at verse 23 through 25. The Bible says, And in that latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance, and understanding dark sentences shall stand up, and his power shall be mighty, and not by his own power. He shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. Verse 25, and through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace he shall destroy many, he shall, be, he shall also stand up against the prince of pieces, or excuse me, the prince, of, the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. Here's the list of who this guy's gonna be or what he's gonna do. He'll have a fierce countenance, okay? He'll, he'll be a mighty, fearful thing. If you're in the same room with him, you will know that he's presently there. He will understand dark sentences, From this point on, look, from this point on, it's what Richard Harper explained to us. From this point on, we see a lot of stuff that is centers around witchcraft. And, you know, since he's fueled by Satan, you know, we understand this. He he understands dark sentences, okay? These are, this is the occult, dark magic, whatever. His power will be mighty. It won't be by his own power. power. He will destroy wonderfully. Through his policy, the scripture says here, craft shall prosper in his hand. Now listen. I've heard some Democrats, I've heard some Republicans, I've heard some uh, Libertarians and some Tea Tea Party people, their policies. I've never heard a politician that ran his policy by witchcraft. Never had a a politician, I've had a lot of politicians, heard a lot of politicians that that, uh, promised a whole lot more than they delivered. But this guy, by satanic power, will deliver even more than he promised. He will do incredible things. Demonic power. Satan will fuel him as a political leader, empower him. Satan worship, it seems, will be the religion of the day. Craft, witchcraft will prosper in his hand. Again, 2 Thessalon- Thessalonians 2 9 is a, a good verse for you to reference. It says that he's going to rule by Satan. Can I just pause here and say something, okay? As we land the plane here tonight, I want to pause and say this. All of the entertainment interest in the occult that is around today is not random. You know, with zombies and vampires and werewolves and magic, it's not just innocent and it's not helpful to your Christian life or the lives of your children that you're trying to rear for the glory of God. And let me just say this. You know, we were today at Kmart and Walmart and half the stores in the world looking for something but we went through the, you know, all the, the aisles. Of course, it's, it's Halloween time, all right? That's your conscience. That's your liberty between you and the Lord. You work that out in your own family. That's fine. But I tell you what, all the horrible stuff that, you know, is, is represented as humor and entertainment, these kind of, you know, bloody, you know, whatever, killer, whatever, whatever, you got to understand that's exactly 
how the Lord says things are going to work out in the end. Occult, demonic, nasty, witchcraft, that stuff is real. It's not fake. And it's not innocent in any hand. It's, not, it's real, and we have to understand that. It's not just, you know, ha, 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 look there kind of stuff. You know, the Bible says that God is light, and he is righteousness, and he is beauty, and he is holiness, and purity, and cleanness, and true power. And I would say to you, in love that rejects alarmism, I don't believe in alarmism or legalism or heavy-handed lording of a pastor, but in love that rejects being an alarmist, I say to you, flee those witchcraft-type interests. What do we, people of light, have to do with that? Why is it offered so readily to our children? Why is the the children entertainment world so consumed with the occult? And when you watch cartoons and when you watch shows or whatever, why does the occult rise to the top and witchcraft and all of that stuff? I don't know where the perfect line is as a parent in games and TV between C.S. Lewis and Harry Potter and Walking Dead. I don't know that stuff. But I do know that we must strive for some kind of line as believers. And not just accept and swallow and bottle feed to our children the occult. Imagination is one thing in entertainment. Witchcraft, which is very real, is quite another. Understanding the liberty that each of us have in Christ, may I kindly and graciously say that maybe the zombies and the the vampires and the dark magic should not be our entertainment or the entertainments of our families. The scripture says in Philippians very clearly, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Do you think it's random that the world ends with Antichrist being fueled by the craft, by witchcraft, and all the entertainment, the children's entertainment, and all the entertainment on the sitcoms and these dramas that were being offered about the occult, do you think that's just random? You would have to be a fool not to see an agenda. The scripture says here, the Antichrist will magnify himself, by peace will destroy many, he will stand against the prince of princes, Jesus Christ, He becomes so powerful in satanic power that he even stands against Jesus Christ himself, believing that he is God, Antichrist does. And notice the last uh, last phrase of verse number 25. It's only seven words long, but it's awesome. It's something you need to take away tonight. But he shall be broken without hand. That means that Jesus Christ won't even have to touch him just by his word. I think the great hymn writer, theologian, man of God, reformer, Martin Luther said it best when he wrote, and though this world with devil fills should threaten to undo us, we will not fear for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him, his rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure, one little word shall fell him. And, And there you see it, verse 25, highlight it. Star it in your Bible. Antichrist, the Satan that fuels him, we felt. Here's the word of God on the matter. Here's how it works out. Daniel, or excuse me, Revelation 19, 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. This is what Rich Harper read, part of it. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he had doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and his head were, were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. It's a cape, a cape dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. That's us, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that he, that with it, he might smite the nations. And he, that, that's, that is with his word. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven come and gather yourselves together under the supper of the great God that you may eat of the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them the flesh of all men both free and bond both small and great and I saw the beasts and the kings of heaven and their armies or excuse me the kings of earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army and the beast was taken and with him the false prophet 
that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshiped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. That's the expanded version of verse 25, seven words, but he shall be broken without hand. Daniel is commanded in verse 26 to shut up this vision because it's, for, it's not for many days. It's not, the fulfillment is not for many days. And of course, the vision has been opened at least in part to us here in Daniel chapter eight. It is not surprising that after Daniel experiences all this that he just faints. He just, Bleh! you know? He's like one of those fainting goats, no pun intended, to Daniel wait. He just kills over. Some of you have seen those videos. He's sick for certain days, and I want to land the plane tonight by just leaving you with a couple applications, and we're done. Number one, all this stuff is exactly true and will happen. Maybe I didn't describe it the very best way, but it will happen as it happens right here in Daniel 8. And you know what? Looking back on it will be much clearer than looking forward. It is, astonishingly, it is astonishing and fearful because it is true. This world is not going to go on young people willy-nilly as it always has. There will be events and time has moved forward and there is an end. There will be events leading up to the revealing of Antichrist and, and that will change world governments and peace trees with Israel. And we are presently experiencing that setup as we turn on the evening news. It is happening in the Middle East, in Iraq, in Syria, in Palestine, all around and in Gaza, whatever. The pieces are being put, to, put in, in play and the game is afoot. So we can't be indifferent towards the world news. Number two, you can be amazingly in control and doing just fine on the earth and being be all full of yourself like Antiochus Epiphanes or Antichrist and you can think you're getting away with great things but if you ignore Christ or rebel against him, you will be taken down. Okay, I say this particularly again to the young people here tonight that are standing in a great crossroads with what you're gonna do with your life concerning Jesus Christ. And some of you are maybe in your spirit just as arrogant as Antiochus Epiphanes or the Antichrist that thinks that you don't have to surrender to Jesus Christ and that you can run your own life and you're not going to, you're not going to bow to him as king of kings of your life. I would say to you tonight, accept him, embrace him, seek him wholeheartedly, repent, turn away, humble yourself now, Do not rebel against him. And I would say to you, do not mistake the lamb for a chump. The lamb is also a lion to be feared. Number three, I warned you against taking lightly the occult, dark magic. I would ask parents and grandparents to think about that and do something about it. It will be the policy of Antichrist in our world. It is nothing to consider harmless or all moral. It is more than a dress up, spooky, fun, autumn holiday kind of a thing. There's even a reason now why witchcraft, why occult is so much a theme of our children's entertainment and and of our own entertainment. This is an evil agenda working out. You call me an alarmist, but it is true. Number four, I would just say to you, don't be alarmed. Many older folks especially live troubled by our changing times. Well, you probably have a lot of wisdom of that because you, you see what's happening. You see how greatly you senior saints, how greatly the world has changed from when you were children, how incredibly different the attitude towards God even is in our, in our world and in our country. But please understand, this passage is primarily a Jewish passage. The church age believers are already raptured. We are already gone. We're, we're riding the horses, okay? We're behind Christ. We are putting down Antichrist. And I also encourage you with this. Don't be alarmed with the thought of all the principality and powers of the devil that the scripture says war against all of us on a daily basis. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Please do not be discouraged. There's coming a day when the devil will molest us no more. There's coming a day when that is all over. And the one whose vesture is dipped in blood, who's king of kings and lord of lords, will put it all down. Tonight I leave you with Daniel 8 and respect for what's about to happen. Would you stand please tonight?